get that word out uh, expeditiously. All right? So we're in Psalm 119 this morning. Psalm 119. This is the longest chapter in the Bible, and um, it, is a, it is a precious, beautiful, beautiful portion of Scripture. And so our text this morning is going to be Psalm 119, uh, beginning in verse 9 is where we'll start. But before we uh, read God's Word this morning, let's bow our heads and pray, and let's ask for the Lord to bless our time together in God's Word. Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have to hold in our hands the very word of God. We pray that you would speak to our hearts by this word. May the Holy Spirit move among us and do that quiet yet profound work that is only from heaven. Lord, I don't have the ability to touch the hearts of these people. But I pray that you would do that which only you can do. And thereby, may we go away from this place closer to God than when we came. May Christ be glorified in everything that goes on in this service. And Lord, draw us close to yourself. Give the words to say in the preaching and give the power of the Holy Spirit to take those words into the hearts of men and women and young people today. And I pray the same thing for gospel proclaiming ministries all around this world. Today would be a day of, of the sweeping of countless souls into the kingdom of heaven. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Psalm 119 is a, it's a beautiful chapter. It's uh, Psalm 119 is actually an acrostic. Now, for those of you, it's been a long time since you were in English literature class. An acrostic uh, means that in, in the, you know, on Mother's Day, uh, you might get from your children a little card and M stands for something and O stands for something and then M, uh, if they go the whole mother, boy, that is, uh, that is impressive. Usually it's just the M-O-M and, you know, dad just gets like a stick figure on Father's Day anyways. So, but moms, they get a, a little acrostic on Mother's Day. And so Psalm 119, the entire psalm is an acrostic. It's a lot of verses. And so in, uh, in this psalm, you'll look and uh, verses 1 through 8, you might see in your Bible, you might see a little strange looking character before verses 1 through 8, and it says Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so then you get to verses 9 through 16, which will be our text today, and it says Baith. It doesn't say Beth. So if your name is Beth, this is not, I mean, this is for you, but is not dedicated to you. Uh, it is the, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Beth. And so every verse in 1 through 9, excuse me, 1 through 8, begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph. Every, every verse in uh, the second section, 9 through 16, begin with the Hebrew letter Beth. The next section is Gimel. And uh, if you want to learn the Hebrew alphabet, uh, before the year's end, here is your guide to learn the Hebrew alphabet, Psalm 119. So it is an acrostic. Um, it's uh, the, the theme of this longest chapter in all of the Bible is the Bible itself. The theme is God's word, its power, and its beauty, and its importance in the life of the believer. And as we read, the, you, as you read every verse of Psalm 119, you will find that God's word is referenced in every single verse verse all right uh, so just uh, that is it's uh, un, it is its obvious theme and as we read the verses of our text uh, some of these verses that I'll read uh, you might have committed to memory at some time in your life and uh, I just uh, the other day someone told me that they've been working for years to commit Psalm 119, the entire chapter to memory. And they've been working on this for years. I'm not somebody in our church, but if you want to do it, hey, 2021, that would be a great uh, New Year's uh, challenge for you. Memorize Psalm 119. 
but uh, the Word of God is of vital importance in the Christian life. You and I, we cannot grow without God's word. It is our, it is our impetus, it is our fuel for growth, it is our defense against the temptation of the devil. Remember when you were a kid? Uh, at least we did this uh, in, my, in my family and among my friends when I was little. We would have these contests for who could hold their breath the longest. Right? And whether you're doing it in the pool and you go underwater so you can stay underwater the longest, or whether you're just sitting with your friends and seeing who can hold their breath the longest. And I have one of these friends that was always secretly breathing through his nose. Okay, you would have passed out like 10 minutes ago and you say you're still holding your breath. I mean, come on now. But uh, we had these contests. You know, as adults, we say, why would I be so foolish to do such a thing? I'm just happy if I get to the top of the steps without being winded. Uh, but we would have these these contests who can hold their breath for the longest you know even if you uh, really worked it up and you took some really deep breaths to fully oxygenate oxygenate your body to the maximum uh, the strongest of us could only hold our breath for a few minutes um, but so uh, when we go without Bible reading it's about like that it's about like trying to hold our breath. Some people might be able to go for a little bit longer before there are any serious effects than others. Uh, they may be able to retain some outward form of godliness that it's not going to draw other people's attention uh, due to their own They've already memorized a lot of scripture. They've been in church a long time and, uh, and their, you know, God's word is just in their hearts. But we all, eventually, when we are not in God's word as we ought to be, eventually it's going to be like when we were kids trying to hold our breath. Eventually we've got to get or we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fail. And, you know, if you don't eventually take a breath, what's going to happen? You're going to pass out. If you don't eventually, as a believer, get into God's word, it is going to have catastrophic effects on you as a believer. We need to stay in shape spiritually by feasting on God's word so that when difficulties arise, we're going to have the spiritual strength. We're going to have the spiritual wherewithal to be able to respond. Let me ask you this. If you were at the bank, and I know the banks are probably, your banks are all are probably closed right now anyways, but just imagine with me. If you were at the bank and you were standing in line to be the next person at the teller and someone burst into the bank lobby and with a firearm and said, uh, and said everybody get on the ground, I'm going to rob this bank right now. And uh, you looked around you to see, is there anybody here that I feel might keep me safe at this point of crisis? If you looked on one side of you and there stood a man and he is in his army fatigues and he clearly you look in and you say, I believe that man is probably an army ranger. You know, he looks like he is, uh, he is prepared. He is, he has gone through training. So you've got an army ranger on one side of you. And then you look on the other side of you and you have a, uh, an Xbox soldier. All right. You know, his thumbs are in peak condition. Okay. And, uh, and he can take a controller and wipe out a whole lot of, uh, of bad guys with his thumbs. If he's got an Xbox controller, which person person are you going to feel most uh, assured by? Is it going to be the guy who has gone through years of training uh, for moments of crisis, or is it going to be the, the other guy who gets winded getting up from the couch to go get a, uh, uh, a ding-dong and some Fritos? Which one are you going to feel uh, most confident in? Of course, you're going to say, all right, this may be a bad day, but there's hope because this guy who is here, he may be our way to get out of this safely. A person who is out of shape isn't able to respond quickly. They get, uh, they get winded. Believers, we need to be conditioning ourselves by God's word.
You can't be spiritually strong today because of the training and because of your diligence five years ago or even five weeks ago. It is something that you need to be today engaged in, conditioning yourself, training yourself by God's word. Don't get to the place spiritually where you are in a crisis and you can't get out of a burning building spiritually. And you know what I'm talking about there. Don't get yourself in that kind of a situation. So Psalm 119, I want to read beginning in verse 9, as I said, and uh, read down through verse 16. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This morning, I just want to look at a few things from these verses. The first thing that I want to see, I want to see the danger. The danger. Last week, when I drove up, uh, in, the bill, uh, drove up in the parking lot one day, uh, as I was pulling up, I saw a beautiful big uh, doe in the backyard, and uh, she was she was beautiful. And uh, I tried to very, very quietly, you know, pull my truck to its place, very quietly get out and put my stuff inside. And once my stuff was inside, I tried to creep back out and see if she was still there. And sure enough, there she was, and she still didn't, if she knew that I was there, uh, it wasn't apparent that, that she knew. But after a few minutes, it was like she got wind of, uh, of my smell. And you know how it happened. Happens, right the white tail pops up and she's gone into the woods and just disappears into those thickets uh, see God created deer to be skittish right what is a deer I mean have you <clears throat> have you ever seen a deer chasing something to eat it no deer are perpetual prey they are not predators of anything um, so they're always on the lookout for danger. They smell danger. They hear danger. Their, their senses are keen. Uh, as, and that is, for a deer, that is their greatest defense. Here the psalmist smelled danger. Here the psalmist smelled danger to his soul. He smelled danger to his enjoyment of God. He smelled danger of temptation that seemed to be lurking all around him. Let me ask you this question. What happens when we see danger and ignore it? What happens? What happens if that deer is in the field and it is uh, munching on a really luscious patch of grass and they see uh, Johnny, he's in the foyer right now, but uh, he's had a successful deer hunting season thus far. I've seen pictures. But what happens if they see Johnny decked out in his camouflage, traipsing out into the field, and that deer says, yeah, you know, he's there, but, you know, I, I've seen him shoot a bow and arrow. He's not that good. I can probably wait just a few more minutes, and, uh, and I'll be safe for a few more minutes, so it puts its head down and continues to munch on that, uh, munch on that good-tasting grass lunch. Well, it's not going to take long before the arrow finds its mark. Because when we, when we sense danger, when we see danger, we need to respond to it. Um, dear Christian, can you sense from day to day, can you sense the lurking of the devil? The Bible tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion. 
And he is walking about. He is seeking whom he may devour. Who is that? That is you and me. The devil, if you know Christ is your Savior, the devil absolutely hates you. The devil hates you. And the devil wants to see your ruin. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And the word for devices there means thoughts. It means designs. It means purposes. I must not be ignorant of what the devil purposes against me. Uh, I, I, I may not always be aware of how the devil is going to go about today tempting me. I may not be aware of how the devil is going to put his foul plan of temptation into operation, but I must be aware that there is a diabolical plan, there is a diabolical purpose against me, and you must as well. Paul tells these believers at Corinth that he fears lest the devil would get an advantage over some of them. Maybe even this week, the devil has stealthily crept in. And some of you would have to say, truth be told, the devil delivered a knockout blow to me this week. I just, I took it on the chin and I failed. Maybe. Maybe. We need to be aware that the devil is out there. His thoughts, his intentions are always for your destruction. For 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, Paul says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's a good fear. That's a good fear that we need to have. First, Paul says, I must not, I'm, I've got to not be ignorant of the devil's mind. I've got to not be ignorant of his plans and his purposes. Now he says, I fear that the devil is creeping into your minds. He's affecting your minds. And he feared the devil taking believers away from what he said was the simplicity of Christ. Now, it's a common myth in Christian circles that whatever your problem is, especially, you know, and I've, say, I've said this many times, uh, my problems are complicated and difficult. Your problems are very, very simple. And uh, we've seen that as we've been going through the book of Job on Sunday nights. That uh, Job's friends came in and they were well-intentioned. But as far as Job's problems went, they had them all figured out. It was a very simple answer as to why Job was suffering. In Christian circles, it is very tempting to say that whatever our problem is, there's always an easy cure. That's, you know, kind of the, the panacea, the, the antidote that can be put to anything is just read your Bible, just pray, just give, just uh, share the gospel with people every day. Now understand something. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the answer. That's simple. But there's a big difference between something being uh, simple, as in not complex, and something being easy. Christ, for whatever our temptation is, for whatever it is that the devil is hurling our way, Jesus Christ is the solution, but the resolution may have a lot of difficult steps. We need to be sure that our minds are focused upon this simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See everything in my life, everything in my existence through the lens of the gospel. And if you're a Christian, you, you must not see your problems, your difficulties, uh, except through the gospel. You are, the Bible tells us, you are a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah for that. It doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle. We're going to struggle. But we're not going to struggle from the same perspective we used to struggle before salvation. Old things, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, old things have passed away. And behold, all things for the believer have now become new. So I am now called to then uh, crucify the flesh and mirror Jesus Christ to people around me. 
Many times our problem is that we think corrupt thoughts. We let bitter thoughts, angry thoughts, selfish thoughts, uh, uh, prideful thoughts, we let those creep in. And as we let those impure thoughts uh, creep in and the wheels of these impure thoughts begin to turn in our minds, uh, it robs us of the focus on the gospel that we need to have. You know, how, what, if you don't have a plan for meditating upon the truths of the gospel, I'm going to go out on a limb here. If you don't have a plan for meditating upon the truths of, of the gospel of God's word, you struggle in your mind. You struggle. You've got to have that emergency plan. Here are the verses that I'm going to meditate upon when I am facing that temptation. That's one of the great benefits of good Christian music. I hope that you have on your phone, uh, in your home, I hope you have some resources for good Christian music. What you sing about, you think about. And if you are filling your heart, if you are filling your mind with these precious truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the onslaughts of the devil come your way, you're kind of when your mind is in neutral. The engine of your mind will be ready revving to the things of the gospel, all right? Music is a free way to the soul. What you sing about will grasp you. And that's why when we fill our hearts and our minds with music that is filled with all kinds of wicked messages, it's no wonder that our minds are invaded with difficult th uh, thoughts that don't please the Lord. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All right? So it's important that you have a plan. Music is a great, it's not the only part of that plan, but it's a great part of that plan. And if you would say to me, Pastor Jared, I just don't know where to put my hands on good Christian music. Let's talk about that. I'd be happy to get you uh, pointed in some right directions. If we, don't, uh, if we don't walk carefully in this world, we're going to be easy prey for the devil. The psalmist here, he perks up. He's like that deer that says, okay, there's something that doesn't smell right. There is something that smells like it could be danger. I need to look around and see if I see something that I need to respond to. We need to walk circumspectly. You know, they say that most accidents and injuries happen in the home. Now, among most things, that's where we spend the most time. However, it's also true that in the home we're very comfortable. And we begin to, the things that we normally do, sometimes we let up on being as careful as we ought to be. We need to, be fed, we need to have homes, we need to have families that are just soaking in God's word. Let our homes be that place where God's word is the chorus that is just running in our homes all the time. We need to be conversing with one another, husband and wife, mother, father, children, talking to each other about the things of the Lord. So he talks about, first of all, the danger. Then the second thing I want to focus in on is the decision. His decision, he says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here is his decision. I must not sin. I must not sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that keeps you away from the Lord. Anything that keeps you away from the Lord. Anything that so dominates your attention and your affection that you can't focus on uh, your, your spiritual walk with the Lord. Anything that so dominates your attention that you can't think straightly about God's word. Now this has become sin to you. Anything that keeps you back from doing that which God has called you to do, that has become sin to you. You know, we'll get into the nicer uh, weather months of the year. And some of you, uh, you enjoy having, uh, you know, I involving your children in all kinds of sports. And that's always a good thing. It's good to keep our kids active. However, 
it, uh, these things are good in their proper place. They need to be enjoyed as an endeavor that can please the Lord. If it is something that robs you week after week after week of being able to be able to worship in God's house among God's people, then guess what? It is something that is keeping you away from that which you need. It becomes sin to you. Romans 14, verse 23, says that anything that is not of faith is sin. Anything that I cannot do as an act of worship, anything that I cannot do as an act of obedience to God, that to me is sin. Now, we have a million different ways of justifying our sin. Liars are very, very good at justifying their lying. They can, uh, thieves are very good at justifying their stealing. But when God begins to work in our hearts, we need to be like the psalmist, like David in Psalm 51. David said, God, against you and against you only have I sinned. And it's not that I haven't sinned against other people, but preeminently, above it all, my offense is before God. God. Even if no other human being is involved in my sin, it, is, it, is, it affects my relationship with God and God is grieved by my sin. I've sinned against God. My decision needs to be with David, with the, with the psalmist here, your word, I've hid in my heart that I might not sin. Every true believer, this is your heart. I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. I don't want there to be something creeping into my life that separates me from God. I would rather uh, be kept from sin than to sin and then have to have that sin cured by repentance. It's better just not to be, not to sin in the first place. Now, I love the opportunity to rejoice in God's deliverance. You know, it's always great when somebody is sick and we gather around, we pray for that person, Lord, would you heal this person? And the Lord does heal that person. That's always a wonderful thing. And we have so many people that we're praying for right now that are struggling with various physical illnesses. And we pray, God, would you heal these people? God, would you touch them? And you know, when, when someone is healed, we rejoice in that. But wouldn't it be better if they never got sick to begin with? Wouldn't that be good? So the same thing with sin. Sure, yes, God does forgive us. God does cleanse us. But wouldn't it be better to never sin in the first place? My daily decisions need to be founded on this purpose. I don't want to sin against God. You and I, we will all answer to God one day. We will all answer to God one day. You will answer, you know, the Bible doesn't even say that a parent will answer for their children. The Bible says every one of us will give an account of himself to God. In fact, this is one of the frightening things for me. The only person in the Bible that it talks about giving an answer for somebody else, the Bible tells me that I will give an answer to how I led you spiritually. That to me is terrifying. Terrifying. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Joseph was approached, and we went through that series on the life of Joseph. Joseph was approached by Potiphar's wife as she tried her best to seduce him day after day. And then one day, as we read, uh, there came a day when she grabbed a hold of his uh, robe. And uh, Joseph, what did he do? He left his robe in her hands and he ran as fast as he could. He said, I would rather run away in my skibbies than sin against God. There may be a million different rationalizations, humanly speaking, as to why this is okay. But I must, God sees it, I must not sin against God. Daniel was a slave of the king of Babylon. The king appointed a certain diet for these slaves uh, in order to try to make them into the best slaves that they could be. 
But what the king wanted Daniel to eat was something that God told him you're not supposed to eat. They had all kinds of dietary regulations that they were supposed to follow. And so Daniel requested of his, of the people that were in authority over him, would it be possible for something else to be given to me? Uh, and, but behind Daniel's request was a rock solid determination that no matter what, if this costs me my life, I'm not going to eat what God said I must not eat. Daniel was a young man. But he was a young man who had a backbone of steel, and he determined that he was going to do right before God. Let me tell you, those of you young people, from the youngest of you in this room, and we've got the young ones in here with us today, but to, for all the young people, don't fall to this temptation that says, you know what, when I get old, then I'll serve God. You know, when I get like 30 I got nothing to live for at that point anyways, right? It's all over. And at that point, you know, when I'm old and wrinkled at 30, then I'll just, uh, I'll get my life on track for God. Don't buy into this notion that you'll get holier as you get older. Now, as we get older, sometimes we lack the physical strength to be able to do some of the stupid things that we did when we were young. Yeah, all of us uh, can, can attest to that. But the flesh is just as corrupt. The flesh is just as wicked and just re as rebellious against God as it ever has been. And the devil will come to you and will paint sin to be such a good thing, such a fulfilling thing. And you know, holiness, living for God, it's so boring. It's such a, it's such a drag. Understand something, young people, and for all of us, anybody can sin. Anybody can give in. Anybody can give in to peer pressure. You, uh, and, but it is the, uh, uh, Paul told Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, he said, O man of God, flee these things, that is sin, and instead pursue godliness. There is a, there is a strength that is demonstrated in godliness. People that go with the crowd, they're a dime a dozen. Those who, who are bold and courageous enough to stand up for what they know to be right. That takes courage. Don't let the devil fool you into thinking that you are so bold and so courageous to do what the crowd wants you to do. Oh, how many young people, they get their tails twisted. Their friends get them all revved up to, go to do this or to do that. And then their friends step back and let them do something stupid. And then they laugh when you get in trouble. You've been there. I was there when I was a kid. I said, this is stupid. The danger. With the decision. And now number three, very quickly, the diligence. David says here, I have perceived the danger. I have decided that I will not sin against God. So what then is the answer? He says, your word have I hid in my heart. That doesn't mean just reading. Some of you, you know, you make a decision, I'm going to read through my Bible in the year, and, you know, you spend a few minutes and you let your eyes go over the page and you check off the box that you did the reading for the day. You're better off to take a smaller portion and really dig in, really read it. There's no benefit of eyes going across words on a page. Here he says even more, I've hid your word in my heart. Not only have I read it, but I've received God's word into my innermost affections. It's more than reading. It's more than even memorizing. It means that we are going to be reading our Bibles like treasure hunters. Some of you enjoy watching uh, things on television about hunting for treasures. Uh, I've even known several in the church that you know buy a metal detector and they'll go around and try to hunt for treasures. We need to read the Bible like a person is seeking for treasure. We're going along seeking out that precious gem that is going to today keep my eyes on Jesus Christ and keep me away from sin today. When Jesus was tempted, 
uh, by the devil when he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, how did Jesus respond? How did he respond? Every single time the devil tempted him, Jesus said these words, it is written. He came back to God's word. Your word I've hid in my heart. I've memorized it. I'm meditating upon it. It is there. I'm mulling it over. It is there for quick and easy access. I've hidden it there so that I might not sin against you. How do you hide God's word in your heart? You do it by, by repeating it to yourself over and over and over again. How does a person who is in the military, how do they prepare for what to do? Or even in the, uh, in the police or other places where people have to respond in times of crisis. How do they train for that? They train for that by going through mock uh, 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 drills of here's what that time of crisis might look like. And they'll make the noises like the guns going off and things like that. Even sometimes they'll, they'll use live fire. Why? Because if the first time a person got into that crisis was the, uh, was, was the real crisis, we freeze up. We don't know what to do. We need to be going over God's word in our minds so that when that time of crisis comes, we know what to do. We are ready. We've prepared for this. And I've got God's word in my heart. The devil is doing his best to bring me down today. But God's word is on my heart. And that is my defense. You know, we have such access today. There's so many study helps available today. Many of you, even this morning, you know, you don't, you're not even holding a paper Bible in your hand. You've got the Bible on your phone. You've got the Bible on your tablet. That's wonderful. We've got fingertip access to a million different study helps. And with all of our access to all of these great resources, we are failing spiritually at a catastrophic rate. And what's the problem? Our problem isn't a lack of information. Our problem is a lack of taking that information and hiding it in our hearts so that we don't sin against God. There are a lot of good resources out there. You know, this is, a, this is news, a flash news for you. The internet can be used for more than gossip. The internet can be used for more things than self-centeredness. The internet can be used for some wonderful things that will help you in your walk with God. There's so many things out there. You say, you know what? You know, there's all those good resources out there. But pastor, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy. We have all these things that we've invented to try to save ourselves time, and we are more slaves to these things than we have ever been before. Put it this way. If you are too busy for God's word, you are too busy. You need to make some changes. And do we think, really, do we think that busyness is a modern problem? Do we think that this busyness is something that has just come up in the last 50 years? Try washing your clothes in the river this afternoon. Just give it a shot. See how that goes as opposed to throwing them in your washing machine. Try cooking your meal over an open fire. I mean, some of us like to do that, going camping for a day or two, but it gets old after a very short time. Do you think they were busy in that day? Oh, they were busy in that day. If you're too busy for God's word, you're too busy. It's time to evaluate your priorities. People today, what are we? We're like chickens running around with our heads cut off, right? I heard someone say the other day, they said, uh, uh, this person is like a head with a chicken cut off. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. You are like a chicken with your head cut off. Let me tell you something. A chicken with his head cut off has two speeds, manic and dead. Manic and dead. And some of you are, are in the manic stage right now, and you are running around aimlessly. You're bumping into stuff. You're making a mess of everything, and you're about to drop. It's about to happen. The devil is lurking. And when that chicken with its head cut off does drop, it never gets back up again. It's all over. We're running around so manic, so crazy. But if we're not in the Word of God, the time will come when all of the activity, spiritually speaking, is going to come to a screeching halt. 
And when it does, it's going to be for good. I, will, I won't hide the word of God in my heart with a quick five minutes in God's word every day. It's not going to happen that way. I need to get into God's word. I need to settle into God's word and treasure it. I need to seek God's word like somebody that is seeking for treasure. Now, I've got a little uh, visual aid for you here this morning. And I've given this illustration before, but many of you weren't here last time I gave it. So here we go. Migratory birds in the state of Washington were, uh, the state was uh, having a program to tag these migratory birds. And they tagged uh, some crows with a, with, a, with a foot tag. And the foot tag, they just, uh, they labeled it Washington Biological Survey. Now they couldn't fit all those uh, words uh, on that one tag, so they abbreviated. And so on each tag, it just said wash, by all serve. Everybody can see that, right? So um, the, uh, they had to change that abbreviation because as the story goes, uh, a farmer from Arkansas uh, sent a letter to the department and it said this, Dear sirs, I shot one of your crows. My wife followed the cooking instructions attached. She washed it, boiled it, and served it. It was the worst thing I've ever eaten. flawed instructions. There are a lot of instructions in this world that are flawed. There are a lot of directions in this world that you can't trust. But you will never go wrong. Ever. You will never, ever, ever go wrong when you read God's Word and you treasure God's Word in your heart. What does the Bible say? Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. You don't need to social distance with God. Let me tell you this. Today, you are as close to God. I would think about this. You are as close to God as you want to be. That's the truth. You are as close to God as you want to be. Because Jesus said, the, ones who, the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. No one has ever found a stiff arm when they try to approach God. We don't social distance with God. What a treasure he has given to us in his word. It is our infallible, it is our unerring rule in this life. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Men and women and young people this morning, are you in God's word? Are you in God's word? This isn't only for the, for the old, uh, crusty adults. This is for all of us. Are you in God's Word? One of our young people, and he's uh, one of the families that hasn't been here since we closed down. You know, they've got, they're uh, concerned because of a family member. But this young person, I've been checking in with him. Week at, uh, well, usually about once every two or three weeks. And I ask him, you've been reading your Bible? Yes, Pastor, I've been reading my Bible. I'm on track. I talked to him the other day. I will finish up my Bible next week. Hallelujah. I say, finish the course. Don't stop now. You're at the finish line. Keep on pressing on. Get into God's Word. Adults, young people, you know what? Those of you who are the youngest ones, you may not be able to read the entire Bible in a year. You know, you're not going to read the whole New Testament. But you know what? Can you read a chapter a week? You better believe you can read a chapter a week. Make habits now of getting into God's Word. Are we following what the book says? The directions, the instructions of this world are flawed at best. I mean, just think about the directions and the instructions that we have received as an onslaught from the government through this crisis that we're in. Do this, do that, don't do this. Okay, this thing we told you before to do, don't worry about it now. Okay, now you got to do it again. Man's directions, and I don't mean that to be a political statement, but man's directions are undependable. We don't know what is truth. God's word never changes. God has given us this book to prepare us for every wicked thought, every wicked intent the devil brings our way to prepare ourselves before the temptation comes. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Are you in God's word? What's your plan?
What's your plan? Right now, did today, today already, have you followed a plan for Bible reading? Did you follow a plan for Bible reading yesterday? If you don't hide God's word in your heart, it says your word have I hid in my heart, then I might not sin against you. So what does that mean? If I don't hide God's word in my heart, what's going to be the result? I will sin against you. Don't be ignorant. Don't be a sitting duck to the devil's devices. Get into the book. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would work in our hearts. I pray that you would help us to search your word like a person uh, searches for hidden treasure. Help us to be diligent and full of expectation. And Lord, would you work in some heart today, someone that to this point they have not had a plan They've not had a resolution for getting into the word. May today be the day that they say, I'm going to get into God's word. I'm not going to wait till 2021. I'm going to get into God's word today. Or strengthen us in this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.